presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Raymond Massey, Faye Bainter, and Otto Kruger in Abe Lincoln in Illinois. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When I was a boy, there were thousands of people alive who had known Abraham Lincoln, had watched his inauguration, heard him speak at Gettysburg, and looked on as a train draped in mourning took him back to his beloved Illinois. But tonight he lives for all of us again, portrayed by a gifted star, Raymond Massey in Robert E. Sherwood's great play, Abe Lincoln in Illinois, a Pulitzer Prize drama on Broadway and a distinguished motion picture. Mr. Massey starred in both productions and brings the stage play to Los Angeles this week, which gave us just the opportunity we'd been waiting for to get the original star in a radio adaptation of the Sherwood play. As Mary Todd, we present another favorite of Broadway and Hollywood, Miss Faye Bainter, in her first appearance here this season. And as Ninian Edwards, a friend of Lincoln, we have Otto Kruger. Abe Lincoln in Illinois is an American saga, the story of a young man with the courage, humor, and great heart that makes America American. It's the drama of Lincoln before he became a national hero, a man so simple, friendly, and unaffected that (laughs) that the politicians couldn't understand him at all. It's not easy to picture Illinois when Lincoln was a young man. Much of it was backwoods. Politics was strictly a man's affair, because women couldn't vote. And the district forum was the general store, where you could buy anything from sunbonnets to sassafras tea. Unfortunately for the ladies, you could not buy Lux toilet soap. But the march of civilization brings the progress of beauty... And today, the woman who values her appearance can find Lux soap everywhere. Luxurious, but not a luxury. It's with very special pride now that we raise the curtain on Act One of Abe Lincoln in Illinois, starring Raymond Massey as Lincoln, Faye Bainter as Mary Todd, Otto Kruger as Ninian Edwards, and Calvin Thomas from the stage cast as Josh Speed. A lonely cabin stands on the prairie near New Salem, Illinois. Across its bare logs, the wind blows steadily, creeping through the chinks in the rough wall, fluttering the oil lamp swinging overhead. Sitting at a table piled high with books and papers is Mentor Graham, a sharp but patient schoolteacher. And across from him in the shadows, his pupil, a beardless, gaunt young backwoodsman in ragged clothes. Now for the moods. Every one of us has many moods. You yourself have more than your share of them, Abe. They express the various aspects of your character. And so it is with the English language. And name me the five moods, Abe. Indicative, imperative, potential, subjunctive, and infinitive. And what do they signify? Well, the indicative mood's the easy one. It just indicates a thing like he loves or he is loved. The imperative mood is used for commanding, like get out and don't come back. Is that the best example you can think of? Well, you can put it in the Bible way. Go thou in peace, but it's still imperative. Here, Abe. This is a speech delivered by Mr. Daniel Webster before the United States Senate. Find me a good example of the imperative move. Oh, let's see. While the Union lasts, we have... Let their last feeble glance rather behold the glorious ensign of the Republic. That's right. Liberty first and Union afterward. Liberty and Union, now and forever, one and inseparable. He must have had them up on their feet cheering at that, all right. Oh, some cheered and some spat, depending on which section they came from. What was he talking about? It was in the debate over the right of any state to secede from the Union. And he proved that without Union, we'd have precious little liberty. Now, uh, go on with the potential move. That signifies possibility, usually of an unpleasant nature. Like, if I ever get out of debt, I'll probably get right back in again. <laughs> Why did you select that example? Nah, it just happens to be the thought that's always heaviest on my mind. 
the store in trouble again? Yes. Barry's drunk all the whiskey we ought to have sold, and we're going to have to shut up any day now. I guess I'm my father's son. All right. Give me a good, steady job, and I'll fail at it. You haven't been a failure here, Abe. There isn't a man jack in this community that isn't fond of you and anxious to help you get ahead. I know, just like you, Mentor. Sitting up late nights nice to give me learning just out of the goodness of your heart. Now, Josh Speed and Judge Bowling Green, some of the others I owe money to, want to get me the job of postmaster, thinking that maybe I can handle that since there's only one mail comes in a week. <laughs> well, I got friends, all right, but they can't change my luck. It'll always be the same story with me. More friends and more debts. Well, Abe, just bear in mind that there are always two professions open to people who fail at everything else. There's school teaching and there's politics. And I'll choose school teaching. You go into politics and you may get elected. <laughs> yes, there's always that possibility. If you get elected, you gotta go to the city. I don't want none of that. Oh, what's your objection to cities, Abe? Have you ever seen one? Sure. I've been down river twice to New Orleans. You know, every minute of the time I was there, I was scared. Scared of what, Abe? Oh, it sounds kind of foolish. I was scared of people. Oh, <laughs> did you imagine that they'd rob you of all your gold and jewels? No. I was scared they'd kill me. Why? Why should they want to kill you? I don't know. Oh, you're a hopeless mess of inconsistency, Abe Lincoln. What do you mean, Mandor? I've never seen anyone who's so friendly... And at the same time, so misanthropic. What's that? A misanthrope is one who distrusts men and avoids their society. Oh, or maybe that's how I am. Oh, I like people well enough when you consider them one by one, but they seem to look different when they're put into crowds or mobs or armies. Abe, there's one more thing I want to show you tonight. It's a poem on death written at the age of 19 by John Keats. You read it, Abe. Can death be sleep when life is but a dream? And scenes of bliss pass as a phantom boy. The transient pleasures as a vision seem, and yet we think the greatest pains to die. How strange it is that man on earth should roam and lead a life of woe, but not forsake his rugged path. Nor dare he view alone his future doom, which is but to awake. That sure is good, Manor. It's fine. Morning, Josh. Well, it's come. Let her just arrive from Washington. You're the new postmaster, Abe. The new postmaster. Well, that's nice, Josh. Do you think I'll be able to carry all the responsibility? <laughs> <laughs> Take a letter over to Rutley's Tavern first. Well, hurry up, Abe. We'll be waiting for you. Morning, Miss Ann. Oh, Abe. I'm glad you came, Abe. Got a letter here. A letter for me? Miss Ann Rutley, Rutley's Tavern. That's you, Miss Ann. Oh, thank you, Abe. What's all that? Abe, it's that ruffian Jack Armstrong. I'm afraid there's going to be a fight in there. Fight? Who and why? Well, the governor's son is here. Abe, Abe, come in here, will you? Come in, Judge Green. Come on, stand up. Stand up, Mr. Edwards. Be careful, Mr. Edwards. I'm afraid there's nothing else I can do. Come on, come on. Oh, Jack. Hello, boys. Hello, Hello. Hello. Ain't you fellas drunk yet? <laughs> <laughs> Abe, there's going to be a fight. What about? This is the son of Governor Edwards, Abe. Come from Springfield looking for a little fight, and I'm aiming to oblige. Who's right, stop Abe. It'll be next door to you murder. You trap, Judge Green. Murder's too good for any goose-livered enemy of Andy Jackson. Come on, boys, get it. Wait a minute, boy, Jack. You forgot what day it is? No, I ain't. But I reckon the fourth is as good a day as any to whip a politician. Well, if you just got to fight, Jack, you shouldn't give preference to strangers. Being postmaster of this thriving town, I rate as a politician, so you better try a fall with me. Now, look here, Abe. You're stepping into something that ain't none of your business. This is a private matter, a patriotic army. Everything in this town's my business, Jack. It's the only kind of business I got. Besides, I've seen Hannah down by the grove, and she says to tell you to come on to a picnic, and that means now. You better hurry, Jack, or you'll get a beating from Hannah. Oh. All right. Right. Abe Lincoln saved your hide, Mr. Edwards. I'll consent to calling off the fight just because he's a friend of mine. Because I'm the only one around here you can't lick. Oh. 
Go on, Jack. Can't it wait? Yeah. All right, but it ain't because I'm afraid. Now, that's one thing. Well, congratulations, Ninian. I shouldn't have enjoyed taking you home to Mrs. Edwards after those boys had done with you. Well, I was aware of the certain consequences, Josh. I'm deeply in your debt, Mr. Lincoln. Sure, never mind any thanks, Mr. Edwards. Jack Armstrong talks big, but he means well. Won't you join us in a drink? No, thank you. Abe, sit down. We want to talk to you. Me? What about bowling? Abe, we brought Mr. Edwards here for the sole purpose of meeting you, and with his permission, I shall tell you why. Go right ahead, Josh. Abe, how would you like to run for the state assembly? <laughs> when? Now, for the election in the fall. Why? Mr. Lincoln, I've known you for only a few minutes, but that's long enough to make me agree with Josh Speed that you're precisely the type of man we want. The whole Whig organization will support your candidacy. This was all your idea, Josh? Oh, no, Abe. You're the people's choice. What do you think, Abe? Oh, it's a comical notion, all right. Don't know as I can give an answer to it offhand, but my first hasty impression is I don't think much of it. Abe, what's the one thing you want most? You want to learn. Well, this will give you a chance to get at a good library, to associate with the finest lawyers in the state. Mm, I got a copy of Blackstone already. Found it in an old junk barrel. How do I know that the finest lawyers would welcome association with me? <laughs> you needn't worry about that. I saw how you dealt with those ruffians. You quite obviously know how to handle men. Oh, I can handle Armstrong and his boys because he can out wrestle them, but he can't go around Sangamon County throwing all the voters. <laughs> we'll take a chance on that, Abe. <laughs> now, think it over, Mr. Lincoln. This is an opportunity unlimited in scope. We're becoming a continent, Mr. Lincoln, and all that we need is men. And now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I've got to be moving on. Goodbye, Mr. Lincoln. This meeting has been a happy one for me. Goodbye, Mr. Edwards. Oh, I Abe... Think it over carefully. This is your chance, Abe. Well, think about it, Josh, but I can tell you now I don't like it. Well, goodbye, Abe. Miss Ann. Yes? What is it, Abe? I just thought you might like to talk to me, Miss Ann. What about? That letter you got from New York State. What do you know about that letter? Well, I'm the postmaster. Guess to know more than ought to about people's private affairs. I couldn't help seeing that was the handwriting of Mr. McNeil, and I can't help seeing from the look on your face that the bad news you've been afraid of has come. Whatever the letter said, it's no concern of yours, Abe. Eh? I know that, Ann. But it appears to me that you've been crying, and it makes me sad to think that something could have hurt you. You're a Christian gentleman, Abe Lincoln. No, I ain't. I'm a plain, common sucker with a shirt tail so short I can't set on it. <laughs> Well, sit down anyway, Abe. Here, by me. You're right about that letter, Abe. It's the first I've heard from him in months. And now he says he's delayed by family troubles and doesn't know when he'll be able to get to New Salem again. By which he probably means never. I wouldn't say that, Anne. I would. I reckon you think I'm a silly fool for ever having promised myself to Mr. McNeil. I think no such thing. I liked him myself and still do. He's a smart man and a handsome one, and I wouldn't blame any girl for loving him. I guess I don't love him, Abe. I guess I couldn't love anybody that was as, as faithless as that. Well, then, there's nothing to fret about. I don't believe you know much about females, Abe. Well, maybe I don't. I certainly spend enough time thinking about him. Well... You're a big man, and you can lick anybody, and you can't understand the feelings of somebody who is weak. But I'm a female, and I can't help thinking what they'll be saying about me. All the old gossips all over town. They'll make it out that he deserted me. I'm a rejected woman. They'll give me their sympathy to my face, but they'll snigger at me behind my back. Yes, that's just about what they would do. But would you let them disturb you? I told you. It's just weakness. Just vanity. But something you couldn't understand, Abe. Maybe I can understand it, Anne. I got a kind of vanity myself. It was nothing but vanity that's kept me from declaring my inclination toward you. Abe. See, I don't like to be sniggered at either. I know what I am. I know what I look like. I know I got nothing to offer any girl I'd be in love with. Are you saying that you're in love with me, Abe? Yes. I am saying that. I've been loving you for a long time with all my heart. You see, Anne, you're a particularly fine girl. You got sense and you got bravery. Those are two things I admire particularly. And you're powerful good to look at, too, so it's only natural I should have a great regard for you. But I don't mean to worry about it, Anne. 
Only mention it because if you do me the honor of keeping company with me for a while, it might shut the old gossip's mouth. They'd figure you'd chuck McNeil for someone else, even me. I thought I knew you pretty well, Abe, but I didn't. Why do you say that, Anne? Do you consider I was too forward in speaking out as I did? No, Abe. I've always thought a lot of you, the way I thought you were. The idea of love between you and me. Well, I can't say how I'd feel about that, because now you're like some other person that I'm meeting for the first time. But I can tell you this much, now and truthfully. If I ever do love you, I'll be happy about it. And lucky to be loving a good, decent man. I've always tried hard to believe what the orators tell us, that this is a land of equal opportunity for all. But I've never been able to credit it any more than I could agree that God made all men in his own image. But if I could win you, Anne, I'd be willing to disbelieve everything I've ever seen with my own eyes and have faith in everything wonderful that I'd ever read in poetry books. But I'm not asking you to say anything now, Anne. And I won't ask you until the day comes when I know I've got a right to. Hey, where are you going? I'm going to find Bowling Green and tell him a good joke. A joke? What about? I'm going to tell him that I'm a candidate for the Assembly of the State of Illinois. Well, there it is, Abe. You're elected. State Assembly. Well, I guess I'll have to do my best. But my best ain't none too good. I've been here in the assembly for over a year now without accomplishing a blessed thing. Sometimes I think... Hey. Yes? There's a man here from New Salem. Says he's got news about a friend of yours. Who? A Miss Ann Rutledge. What about her? She's sick, Abe. She's sick. Put in there to die in. That must be Abe now. He said he'd come right over from the Rutledges. Well, let him in, Bowling. Why, hello, Abe. Nancy, I, and Josh here have been sitting up waiting for you. Come in out of the web. Hello, Abe. Hello, Josh. Glad to see you. Nancy. Yes, Abe? She's dead. Am? Yes, tonight the fever suddenly got worse. They couldn't seem to do anything for it. Oh, Abe, I'm so sorry. Sit down, Abe, and rest yourself. No, I'm... I'm not fit company for anybody. I'd better be going. No, you don't, Abe. You stay right here. You better do what Josh tells you. This is your home, Abe. This is where you're loved. Yes, that's right. And I love you, Bolin and Nancy. But I loved her more than anything else I've ever known. I know you did, Abe. I know it. I used to think it was best to be alone. I was always most contented when I was alone. I... Queer notion that if you get too close to people, you could see the truth about them. But behind the surface, they're all insane, and they could see the same in you. And then, when I saw her, I knew there could be beauty and purity in people, like the purity you sometimes see in the sky at night. And I took hold of her hand and held it. All fear, all doubt went out of me. I believed in God. I've been glad to work for her until I die, to get for her everything out of life that she wanted. If she thought I could do it, then I could. That was my belief. And then I had to stand there, as helpless as a twig in a whirlpool, I had to stand there and watch her die. And her father and mother were there too, praying to God for her soul. The Lord give it and the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what they kept on saying. I couldn't pray with them. I'm, I'm making a pretty poor exhibition of myself, and I'm sorry. But I can't stand it. I can't live with myself any longer. I got to die and be with her again, or I'll go crazy. I can't bear to think of her out there alone. Abe, hey, wait. I want you to go upstairs and see if you can't get some sleep. Please, Abe, as a special favor to Nancy and me. All right, boy. Here's a light for you, dear Abe. Thank you, Nancy. Good night. Poor lonely soul. Poor lonely soul.
After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille and our stars, Raymond Massey, Faye Bainter, and Otto Kruger, will bring you Act Two of Abe Lincoln in Illinois. For the next few moments, let's look in on a little home over on Vine Street, where a couple of very young ladies are talking over their first formal party. Oh, Julie, aren't evening parties simply super? I mean, aren't they wonderful? Oh, gosh, I hope we go to millions more. These long dresses make you feel practically 18, don't they? Oh, Julie, you know what Joe Billings said? First he said I I looked okay, and, and then he said, I mean you look swell. Doesn't Joe make you think of Tyrone Power, kind of? And isn't it divine? You and I both danced every dance. Oh, gosh, Mother will be upstairs soon. We better be getting ready for bed. Let's make a dive for the bathroom. Here's a brand new cake of Lux soap for you. Why, Julie Davis, you mean you're not going to bother about your complexion? Well, it's a good thing Mother can't hear you. She'd practically die. Why, she thinks it's just reckless of a girl not to take good care of her skin, no matter how young she is. So I always use Lux soap like she does. You've got to admit, Julie, my mother has a complexion that's simply super. Betty is only 15, but already she knows a real beauty secret. Betty has a wise mother, a mother who gives her own complexion regular active lather care and sees to it that her young daughter does, too. She knows that even the youngest complexion needs the protection that Lux Toilet Soap gives because its active lather does a thorough job gently carries away every trace of dust and dirt. And there are millions of mothers like Betty's mother. That's one reason why Lux Toilet Soap is so very popular the country over. It's a fact that it's as fine a soap as money can buy. Lux Toilet Soap is really pure, and it's laboratory tested for mildness. Complexions that are world famous get Lux Toilet Soap care. This luxurious white soap is the choice of nine out of ten screen stars. So why not make it your regular complexion care, too? Get three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. And let this fragrant soap with active lather give your skin the gentle, protecting care it needs to stay smooth and lovely. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Abe Lincoln in Illinois. Starring Raymond Massey as Lincoln, Faye Bainter as Mary Todd, Otto Kruger as Ninian Edwards, and Calvin Thomas as Josh Speed. Five years have passed. Abe Lincoln is still a young man, but he looks more than his 31 years, for his youth was buried with Ann Rutledge. His term in the assembly over, Abe has taken up law practice in Springfield. He's returning now from a trip as Billy Herndon, the junior member of the firm, greets him at the door. How do, Mr. Lincoln? Glad to see you back. How was it on the circuit, Mr. Lincoln? Oh, by the usual. Did you have an occasion to make any political speeches? Oh, they got me up in the stump a couple of times. Ran into Stephen Douglas. He was out campaigning, of course, and we had some arguments in public. That's good. What issues did you and Mr. Douglas discuss? Oh, don't get excited, Billy. We weren't taking it serious. There was no bloodshed. Well, what's the news here? Well, this letter, they want you to speak at an abolitionist rally next Thursday evening. Billy, I was on the boat coming from Quincy to Alton the other day, and there was a gentleman on board with 12 Negroes. He was shipping them down to Vicksburg for sale, let them chain six and six together. They were going to be whipped into perpetual slavery, and no questions asked. Quite a shocking sight. Then you will give a speech at the Lovejoy rally. I doubt it. That Freeman's League is a pack of fanatics. Talk reason to them, and they scorn you for being a mealy mouth. Let them make their own noise. Hello, Abe. Are we interrupting the majesty of the law? Bowling. I found him at the station, Abe. Hi, Bowling. Tall me well, Abe, and glad to see you. Not interrupting. Not at all. This young firebrand Billy here was just about to launch into another speech on abolition. He's a wildcat, this Billy. Can't stand for anybody who wants to remain peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, my profound compliments. Well, I thought you were opposed to slavery, Abe. I am opposed to slavery, but I'm even more opposed to war, especially civil war. But I see what you're getting at, Bowling. You're following Billy Herndon's lead. You're troubling your kind hearts with concerns of me, and when am I going to amount to something? Well, we've all been hoping you'd run for Congress, Abe. No, I'm no fighting man, Judge. If I got elected and went to Congress, I might find myself someday having to cast my vote on the terrible issue of war or peace. I want no part in deciding things like that. 
or voting to avoid war at all costs at the expense of the Union. You always were an artful dodger, Abe. And maybe you'll go live to go on to the end of your days, avoiding the clutch of your own conscience. Afternoon, Abe. How are you, gentlemen? Ninian, come in. Hello, Ninian. Sit down. Thanks, Abe. Well, I just called in to tell you gentlemen that you must dine with us. Delighted. We're proudly exhibiting my sister-in-law, Miss Mary Todd, who has just come from Kentucky to grace our home. She's a very gay young lady, speaks French like a native, recites poetry at the drop of a hat, and knows the names and habits of all the flowers. <laughs> well, I've asked Steve Douglas and some of the other eligibles to meet her, so you boys had better get in early. <laughs> <laughs> You'll uh, be along presently, Abe? Shouldn't be surprised. Good. You'll meet a delightful young lady, and I'd better warn you, she's going to survey the whole field of matrimonial prospects and select the one who promises the most. So you'd better be on your guard, Abe, unless you're prepared to lose your standing as a free man. Ninian, I thank you for the warning. <laughs> Mary, I can't believe it. Can't believe what, dear? Mary, I am your sister and I want the truth. Now, you have known Abraham Lincoln for six months. Have you ever given one moment serious thought to the possibility of marriage? I shall answer you, Elizabeth. I've given more than one moment's thought to the possibility you mentioned. And I've decided that I shall be Mrs. Lincoln. So, Ninian, you were right. Thank you, my dear. Mary, do you expect me to congratulate you upon this amazing selection? No. I ask for no congratulations, nor condolences either. Well, uh, forgive me for prying, Mary, but uh, have you as yet communicated your decision to the gentleman himself? Not yet. But he's coming to call this evening, and he will humbly ask for my hand in marriage. And after I've displayed the proper amount of surprise and confusion, I shall murmur timidly, yes. Well, you make a brave gist of it, Mary. But as for me, I'm deeply and painfully shocked. Uh, Mary, I should like to know... I think, Ninian, that, uh -huh. that this is a matter for discussion solely between my sister and myself. No, I want to hear what Ninian has to say. Well, understand, my dear, I'm not quarreling with you. My affection for Abe is eternal, but I'm... Curious to know, what is it about him that makes you choose him for a husband? I should like to give you a plain, simple answer, Ninian, but I cannot. Of course you cannot. You're rushing blindly into this. Oh, haven't you sense enough to see you could never be happy with him? His breeding, his background, his manner, his whole point of view. I could not be content with a happy marriage in the accepted sense of the word. I have no craving for comfort and security. So long as there's forever before me the chance for high adventure. So long as I can know that I'm always going forward with my husband along a road that leads across the horizon. And how far do you think you will go with anyone like Abe Lincoln, who is lazy and shiftless and prefers to stop constantly along the way to tell jokes? You'll not stop if I have strength enough to make him go on. And I'm strong. In Abraham Lincoln, I see a man who split rails for other men's fences, but who will never build one around himself. What are you saying, Mary? I imagine it does seem like insanity to you, but not to me. I want the chance to shape a new life for myself and for my husband. Mr. Lincoln, ma'am. He's here. I shall see him. Send him in, please. Good evening, Mrs. Edwards. Evening, Miss Todd. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Lincoln. Good evening, Minnie. Well, glad to see you, Abe. Uh, uh, well, uh, if you'll excuse Elizabeth and me, we must hear the children's prayers and see them safely obey Oh, I'd be glad to hear the prayers, too. Oh, no, no. You, you'd only keep them up till all hours with your stories. And uh, uh, g come along, Elizabeth. Mary, won't you come with us and say goodnight to the children? No, no, no my dear. No, uh, leave Mary here to keep Abe entertained. <laughs> I don't blame Ninian for keeping you away from those children. They all adore you. Well, I always seem to get along well with children, probably because they don't want to take me seriously. You understand them. That's the important thing. But do sit down, Mr. Lincoln. Thank you. I will. No, not there. Over here, by me. Well, Jack, have you finished the letter? Yes. Do you think it's all right? No, Abe, I don't. I think the sending of this letter to Mary Todd would be a most grave mistake. Do I understand that you will not deliver it for me? No, Abe, I won't. Then someone else will. Yes, you can give it to the minister this afternoon to hand to the bride when she arrives for the ceremony. But I hope, Abe, 
You won't send it until you're feeling a little calmer in your mind. How can I ever be calm in my mind until this thing is settled and out of the way once and for all? Have you got eyes in your head, Josh? Can't you see that I'm desperate? I've got to get out of this marriage. I can't go through with it. I've got to have my release. Hello, Abe. Hello, Nancy. Good morning, Josh. You're helping to keep the bridegroom quiet on his wedding day? Best I can, Ninian. Well, I can promise you, Abe, it'll be quite painless. Elizabeth and I have arranged for a bang-up wedding dinner. Good morning, Mr. Edwards. Good morning, Billy. Oh, uh, Abe, I've only got a moment, and this is the last chance I'll have to speak to you before the ceremony. Well, uh, the fact that the bride is my sister-in-law gives me a little added responsibility in wishing to promote the success of this marriage. And the success it will be, Abe, if only you'll bear in mind one thing. You must keep a tight rein on her ambition. Uh, my wife tells me that even as a child, Mary had delusions of grandeur. She uh, predicted to one and all that the man she would marry would be president of the United States. <laughs> well, I urge you to be wary. Uh, don't let her talk you into any gallant crusades or wild goose chases. You let her learn to be satisfied with the estate to which God hath brought her, with which I shall conclude my prenuptial sermon. Well, I have to see you all at the house at 5 o'clock. And I want you gentlemen to make sure that Abe Lincoln is looking his prettiest. Goodbye, Ninian. Well, Abe, you'd better go along home. That's right. You'll be late for the wedding, Mr. Lincoln. There's not going to be a wedding. Billy, I have a letter that I want you to deliver to Miss Ty. What letter? Give to him, John. No, Abe, this letter will never be delivered. Josh, you've got no right to tear that up. You've got no right. I know I haven't, but it's done. Billy, in that letter, Mr. Lincoln asked Miss Todd for his release. He told her that he'd made a mistake and couldn't go through with the marriage, which could only lead to endless pain and misery for them both. That isn't the truth. What is? I'm not disputing the truth of it, Abe. I'm only asking you to tell her so to her face in the manner of a man. It would be a more cruel way. It would hurt her more deeply. I'd have to tell her that I have hit for, for her infernal ambition. That I don't want to be ridden and driven onward and upward through life with her whip lashing me and her spurs digging into me. If her poor little soul craves importance in life, then let her marry Stephen Douglas. He's ambitious, too. I want only to be left alone. Mr. Lincoln, I doubt if may I say something? Contribute. What is it, Billy? Well, it's just this. Mr. Lincoln, you're not abandoning Miss Mary Todd. No, you're only using her as a living sacrifice in the hope that you'll gain forgiveness of the gods for your failure to do your own great duty. Yes, my own great duty. Everyone feels called upon to remind me of it, but no one can tell me what it is. Well, I can tell you. I can tell you what's the duty of every man who calls himself an American. It's to perpetuate those truths which were once held to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they're endowed with certain inalienable rights. That among these are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Are those rights denied to me? Could you ever enjoy them while your mind is full of the awful knowledge that two million of your fellow beings in this country are slaves? Can you take any satisfaction from looking at that flag above your desk when you know that ten of its stars represent states which are willing to destroy the Union? That's your flag, Mr. Lincoln, and you're proud of it. But what are you doing to save it from being ripped into shreds? I'm minding my own business. That's what I'm doing. And there'd be no threat to the Union if others would do the same. And as for slavery, I'm sick and tired of all this righteous talk about it. When you know more about the law, you'll know that those property rights you mentioned are guaranteed under the Constitution. And if the Union can't stand on the Constitution, then let it fall. Hey, hey, where are you going? I'll go up now and I'll talk to Mary. Tell her I can never marry her. Then I'm going away. Where, Abe? I don't know. You're quitting, Mr. Lincoln. As surely as there's a God in heaven, he knows that you're running away from your obligations to him and to your fellow men and to your own immortal soul. Billy, Billy, leave him alone. He's a sick man. Two years later, on the great plain near New Salem, a covered wagon stands in the moonlight facing west. To that wagon across the prairie comes Abe Lincoln. Abe. Abe. I'm glad to see you. Even, sir. I hear your boy is mighty sick. Yes, he is. Aggie's tending him in the wagon now. She wants preacher. That looks as if she'd given up, don't it? Might be a comfort. Why don't you speak a prayer, Abe? You could always think of something to say. Afraid I'm not much of a hand at praying. I couldn't think of a blessed thing be any real comfort. Never mind. Sit down, Abe. So you're heading west, are you, sir? You're doing what you and I used to talk about. You're moving. 
How far are you going? We're going right across the continent. All the way to Oregon. Oregon. We're going to free country, Abe. How do you know it'll be free, sir? With the politicians selling the new territories piece by piece to the slave traders. Because we'll keep it free if we have to fight for it. Even if we have to cut loose and make it a new country. A new country. Yes, I remember Mentor Graham saying once that this country might be split up into hostile countries, just like Europe. It'd be a bad day for us Americans if we lost you and your wife and your son and all the others like you, Seth. Seth? Seth, he's worse. He's moaning in his sleep. He's gasping for breath. Don't cry, Aggie. The doctor will come soon. Oh, it's so far. So far from anyone. Anything. Oh, Seth, what'll we do? If you wish me to, Mrs. Gale, I'll try and speak a prayer. We'd be grateful for anything you might say, Abe. Oh, God, the Father of all living. I ask you to look with gentle mercy on this little boy here, lying sick in this covered wagon. His people are traveling far to seek a new home in the wilderness, to do your work, God, to make this earth a good place for your children to live in. They can see clearly where they're going, and they're not afraid to face all the perils that lie along the way. I humbly beg you not to take this child from him. Grant him the freedom of life. Let him know the sight of great plains and high mountains, of green valleys and wide rivers. For this little boy is an American, and these things belong to him and he to them. Spare him that he too may strive for the ideal for which his fathers have labored so faithfully for so long. Spare him and give him his father's strength. Give us all strength, O oh God, to do the work that is before us. I ask you this favor in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who died upon the cross to set men free. Mr. Lincoln, will you see him, Miss Todd? Yes. Ask him to come in. This way, Mr. Lincoln. I'm glad to see you again, Mr. Lincoln. Thank you, Mayor. You may well wonder why I have thrust myself on your mercy in this manner. I'm sure you're always welcome. We heard through Joshua's speech you'd been very ill. We've all been greatly concerned. You've been most kind. I'm glad you're restored to health. Now you return to your work? Or perhaps you have other plans? I have no plans, Mary. I only want to tell you that I'm sorry for things that I said on that unhappy occasion that was to have been our wedding day. You needn't worry about that. Whatever happened then was my own fault. I was blinded by my self-confidence. I loved you, Abe. And I believed I could make you love me. That I could inspire you to become the leader of men. I believe you are. I didn't think you'd turn that strength against me. Mary, I know now I was wrong. I presume again to ask you to be my wife. Abe. I know that taking me back would involve humiliation for you. I'm not afraid of humiliation, Abe. What has brought about this change of heart? On the prairie, I met an old friend who was moving west with his wife and child. He asked me to go with him after the child recovered. And I was strongly tempted to do so. Abe. But even then I knew that that was not my direction. The way I must go is the way you have always wanted me to go. And you will never again falter or try to run away? I promise you, Mary, that if you will have me, I shall devote myself for the rest of my days to trying to do what is right. As God gives me the power to see what is right. Then I shall be your wife. I shall fight by your side. Till death do us part. Oh, Abe. Abe, I love you. I love you. Whatever becomes of the two of us, I'll die loving you.
curtain falls on the second act. Before Mr. DeMille brings you Act Three of Abe Lincoln in Illinois with Raymond Massey, Faye Bainter, and Otto Kruger, I'd like to ask Sally here a question. Sally, are you married? No, Mr. Ruick, but I hope to be. Have you any brothers? No, I haven't, but why? Well, uh, you must have a father. Naturally, Mr. Census Taker. Sally, does your father sing in the shower? Mr. Ruick, he does. Well, Sally, tell your father that three professors of the University of Southern California approve of it. They say that under a shower, your voice sounds better because hard walls and water around you reflect the sound. And so the voice sounds resonant and full. They say the water striking your body gives you pep. I'll bet many a man is glad to have a sort of official excuse for singing in the shower. Well, my father has an excuse, if he needs one. And you know what it is, too. Certainly, the walls reflect sound Mr. and... Mr. Ruick, my father sings in the shower because he has Lux toilet soap to use. And that's something worth singing about because it lathers so smoothly and richly and does such a thorough job of cleansing so quickly. It makes you feel good all over. That's why my dad sings, Mr. Ruick, and he has a swell baritone at that. I'll bet he has, Sally. You're right. The smooth, rich, active lather Lux toilet soap gives inspires many a bathtub baritone. Men like that grand, luxurious soap that lathers so quickly. It carries away perspiration, every trace of dust and dirt, pronto. Does a real job of cleansing the pores. Yes, a Lux toilet soap active lather bath leaves a man feeling like a million. So, here's a way to make the men folk in your family happy. Get a generous supply of Lux toilet soap tomorrow. You can buy a dozen cakes for very little, you know. Make this fine white soap that you use the family bath soap, too. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on Act Three of Abe Lincoln in Illinois. In the years that followed his marriage, Abe Lincoln walked the path that Mary Todd had dreamed of, climbed step by step, until at last, in a series of debates with Stephen A. Douglas, he emerged into national prominence, the champion of liberty and union. There can be no distinction in the definition of liberty as between one section and another, one race and another, one class and another. A house divided against itself cannot stand. This government cannot endure permanently half slave, half free. What time is it now, Mary? It's nearly half past four. What? You hear that, Abe? Those men will be coming here any minute. No, they will. I almost forgot. What men? Oh, Who, Abe? Just some men from the East. One of them's a political leader named Cremins, and there's Mr. Sturvison. He's a man of fact. Henry D. Sturvison? That's the one, and also the Reverend Dr. Barrick from Boston. What are they coming here for? Well, I don't precisely know, but I presume it's to see if I'm fit to be a candidate for President of the United States. What? I suppose I... they want to find out if we still live in a log cabin and keep pigs under the bed. And you didn't tell me. I'm sorry, Mary. The matter just slipped my mind. You forgot to tell me that we're having the most important guest who ever crossed the threshold of my house. They're not guests, Mary. They're just here on business. Yes, rather important business, it seems to me. They want to see us as we are, crude, sloppy, vulgar, western barbarians, living in a house that reeks of foul tobacco smoke. We can explain about having a son at Harvard. If I'd only known, if you'd only given me a little time to prepare for them. Why didn't you put on your best suit and those filthy old boots? Oh, Mary, I clean forgot. I declare, Abraham Lincoln, I believe you would have treated me with more consideration if I'd been your slave instead of your wife. You've never for one minute stopped to think that perhaps I have some interest, some concerns in the life we lead together. All right, Mary, I'll try to clean up my boots a little. You've seen it all, Joshua Speed. Every bit of it. Courtship, as you could call it that. Change of heart, change back again, and marriage. Eighteen years of it. 
And you probably think, just as all the others do, that I'm a bitter, nagging woman. I've tried to kill his spirit, drag him down to my level. Oh, Mary, I think no such thing. Remember, I know Abe, too. There never could have been another man such as he is. All these years, I've tried and tried to show him the way. And all my efforts have been like so many puny waves dashing against the rock of ages. And now opportunity, the greatest opportunity is coming here to him, right into his own house. And what can I do about it? He must take it. He must see that this is what he was meant for. But I can't persuade him to it. I'm tired. I'm tired to death. I thought I could help to shape him as I knew he should be. And I've succeeded in nothing but in breaking myself. Gentlemen, Mr. Lincoln, you'll forgive us, I'm sure, if we come directly to the point. Yes, sir, I understand that you wish to inspect the prairie politician in his native lair, and here I am. Mr. Lincoln, it is no secret that we are desperately in need of a candidate. One who is sound, conservative, safe, and clever enough to skate over the thin ice of the forthcoming campaign. Your friends believe that you are the man. Well, Mr. Sturgeon, I can only tell you that when I was first considered for political office, that was in New Salem 25 years ago, I assured my sponsors of my conservatism. I have subsequently proved it by never progressing anywhere. Can you agree that you are the man we want? I'm afraid I can't go quite that far in self-esteem, Dr. Barrett. Please understand that this is not an inquisition. We merely wish to know you better, to gain a clearer idea of your theories on economics, religion, national affairs in general. To begin with, in one of your memorable debates with Senator Douglas, your opponent indulged in some of his usual demagoguery about uh, industrial conditions in the North. And you replied shrewdly that... Yes, uh, I remember the occasion. I replied that I was thankful that laborers in free states have the right to strike, violently if need be, against authority that is unjust or oppressive. The Boston Tea Party was a kind of strike. So was the revolution itself. Mm, all perfectly true. But the days of anarchy are over. To put it bluntly, would you, if elected, place the interests of labor above those of capital? I cannot answer that bluntly or any other way, because I cannot tell what I should do if elected. But we of New England are most anxious to know whether you admit one authority to whom devotion is unquestioned. I presume you refer to the Almighty. I do. I think there can be no doubt as to my submission to his will. I'm afraid there is a great deal of doubt as to your devotion to his church. I realize that, Doctor. They say I'm an atheist because I've always refused to become a church member. What have been the grounds of your refusal? My own form of worship is obedience to the Savior's own statement of law and God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. that window, Ninian. What does it look like in Pennsylvania, Ninian? There's nothing to worry about, Mary. It's safe for Abe. In fact, you needn't worry at all. Yes, you've been saying that over and over again all evening. There's no need to worry. But how can we help worrying when every new bulletin shows Douglas ahead? But every one of them shows Abe gaining. Just give them time to count all the votes in New York, and then you'll be on your way to the White House. Why don't they hurry with it? Why don't the turns come in? They're coming soon enough. Any news, Billy? Not yet. Lots of reporters down there, Mr. Lincoln. They want to know what will be your first official action after you're elected. So what, do you, what do you want us to tell them, Abe? Tell them I'm thinking of growing a beard. A beard? Whatever put that idea into your mind? I had a letter the other day from some little girl that ought to have whiskeys to give me more dignity. I'll need it if elected. What is it, Mr. Edwards? Here, give it here. What do they say now? Is there anything new from New York? Connecticut. Abe, far in the lead. Missouri. Douglas, 35,000. What are they cheering for? I don't know. Listen to this clip. The Chicago Times says Lincoln breaks down. Lincoln's heart fails him. His tongue fails him. His legs fail him. He fails all over. 
People refuse to support him. They laugh at him. Douglas is champion of the people. Douglas skins the living dog. I can't stand it any longer. Yes, my dear. I think you'd better go home. I'll be back for long. I won't go home. You only want to be rid of me. That's what you wanted ever since the day we were married. And before that, anything to get me out of your sight because you hate me. And it's the same with all of you, all of his friends. You hate me. You wish I'd never come into his life. No, oh, Mary. Mary. Josh, will you please step out for a moment? Certainly. Why did you do that? Why do you take every opportunity you can to make a public fool out of me and yourself? Bad enough when you act like that in the privacy of our own home, but here in front of people. You're not to do that again, do you hear me? You're never to do that again. Hey. Hey, you. Oh, Eddie. I lost my temper, Mary, and I'm sorry. But I still think you should go home rather than endure the strain of this death watch. This is the night I dreamed about when I was a child. When I was an excited young girl and all the gay young gentlemen of Springfield were courting me. And I fell in love with the least likely of them. This is the night when I'm waiting to hear that my husband has become president of the United States. And even if he does, it's ruined for me. It's too late. There's a bulletin from New York. Douglas, 183,000. Lincoln, 181,000. Look out, Abe. You're catching up. Congratulations, Mr. Lincoln. The next bulletin from New York will show you in the lead. We've fought the good fight and we've won. Seems to me the battle is just beginning, Mr. Derby. Down in South Carolina, they raised 10,000 volunteers. They're arming them. The governor has issued a proclamation that if I'm elected, South Carolina will secede tomorrow. And every other state south of the Dixon line will secede with it. Can you see what that means? It means war. Civil war. Here it is! Lincoln is elected! Honest Abe is our next president! <laughs> Better say something to them, Abe. My dear friend, I have to say goodbye to you now. I'm leaving for Washington with my new whiskers, of which I hope you approve. <laughs> no one, no one not in my situation can appreciate my feelings of sadness at this party. To this place and the kindness of you people, I owe everything. I have lived here for a quarter of a century, and passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born and one is buried. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I may return. I am called upon to assume the president at a moment when 11 of our sovereign states have announced their intention to secede from the Union. Threats of war increase in fierceness from day to day. It is a grave duty which I now face. In preparing for it, I have tried to inquire what great principle or ideal it is that has kept this union so long together. And I believe that it was not the mere matter of separation of the colony from the motherland. But that sentiment in the Declaration of Independence, which gave liberty to the people of this country and hope to all the world, that sentiment was the fulfillment of an ancient dream which men have held through all time. A dream that one day they might shake off their chains and find freedom in the brotherhood of life. We gain democracy. Now there is doubt whether it is fit to survive. Perhaps we have come to the dreadful day of awakening. The dream is ended. If so, I am afraid it must be ended forever. I cannot believe that ever again will men have the opportunity that we have had. Perhaps we should concede that and admit that our ideals of liberty and equality 
are decadent and dull. I have heard of an Eastern monarch who once charged his wise men to invent him a sentence which should be true and appropriate at all times and situations. They presented him with the word, and this too shall pass away. That's a comforting thought in times of affliction. And this too shall pass away. Yet, let us believe that it is not true. Let us live to prove that we can cultivate the natural world around us and the intellectual and moral world within it so that we may secure an individual, social, and political prosperity whose course shall be forward and which, while this earth endures, shall not pass away. I commend you to the care of the Almighty, as I hope in your prayers you may remember me. Goodbye, my friends and neighbors. Abraham Lincoln goes on to Washington and his place in this democracy. Now Raymond Massey is returning to the microphone with Faye Bainter for a curtain call. I'd like to join an audience from coast to coast in saluting Raymond Massey's fine performance as Abraham Lincoln. Thank you, Faye. You've given us all so many very great moments in the theater that well, I appreciate that more than I can say. After the playing, after playing the part six or seven hundred times, Mr. Massey, it's evident that you still like to do it. I wanted to play Mr. Lincoln for about 20 years. When I was a boy, there was a friend of my father's who had talked to Mr. Lincoln, and he told me many stories about him over and over again. It always made him seem much more to me than just a picture in a history textbook. And I think in times like these, his story and himself has a new meaning not only for America, but for the whole world. Ever since I became an actor, I've been hoping that someone would write a play like Abe Lincoln in Illinois. Very fortunately, my old friend Robert Sherwood did so, so I had an inside track on the part. Just now, I'd like to say that I've enjoyed my first appearance in the Lux Radio Theater, and I hope very much it won't be the last. <laughs> we'll guarantee that with one hand and shake a warning finger at Faye Bainter with the other. A warning that our next vacation from this microphone is going to be very short. Well, Mr. Mill, that's more than all right with me. As a matter of fact, the part behind this radio theater is a regular part of my household. Lux Soap has been my complexion care for years. Whether I've been working in Hollywood or working in the flower garden on my farm in New York State. To put it in a few words, I like it. I think you'll like our bill for next Monday night, too, Faye. What is it, Mr. DeMille? Well, next week, we're going to have Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor. In one of the world's great love stories, Smiling Through. The drama of a man and woman meant for each other, but kept apart by a strange secret hanging over them from the past. The play was a Broadway and motion picture success. And we predict that Smile and Through will score again next Monday night with Robert Taylor and Barbara Stanley. I remember the stage production, Mr. DeMille. It's a grand show. Good night. Good night. Good night. You've made history of your own tonight. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor in Smiling Through. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Third in tonight's play were Ted Bliss as Billy Herndon, Doreen Tuttle as Ann Rutledge, Cy Candle as Sturgeon, Paula Nash as Mentor Graham, Forrest Taylor as Judge Bowling Green, Claire Badera as Elizabeth Edwards, Earl Ross as Jack Armstrong, Lou Merrill as Ben, Verna Felton as Nancy, and Harry Humphrey and Marcella Powers. Now, an important announcement. As you know, many localities switch to daylight saving time next Sunday. If your community is one of those changing to daylight saving time, you will hear this program at the usual hour. If your community remains on standard time, tune in one hour earlier. Check your newspaper or radio magazine for the correct time. Faye Bainter will soon be seen in the picture, Our Town. Otto Kruger's current picture is the Warner Brothers production, Dr. Ehrlich's Magic Bullet. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.